we had had up front the first night that it identifies the 1290. No, we're going to put the chart back up, but it identifies the 1290 and the 1335 time prophecy of Daniel 12. And of course it identifies the 1260 year prophecy. And it identifies the 391 year and 15 day time prophecy. And it identifies the 2520 and it identifies the 23 year, year 100 prophecy. And in Daniel 12, 7, and Daniel, Daniel 12 is where many in Adventism go off into darkness in their prophetic understanding. Because they take the time prophecies in Daniel 12, the 1290, the 1260, the 1335, and they try to apply them at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion. And in so doing, they're destroying the foundations of Adventism. Because the pioneers understood all those time prophecies were fulfilled at or before 1844. And in Revelation 10 verse 7 we're told that time is no longer and Sister White comments on that verse over and over again saying we'll never have another message that's hung upon time. Whether it's a year day principle or a day for a day principle time is no more after 1844. So on your notes on the bottom of page 7 I, I want to show you something and uh, see if this is important to you. Verse 7 of Daniel 12 says and I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, which held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, that it shall be for times, times and a half, and when he has sh shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now what's a times, times and a half in Bible prophecy? It's 1260 years, isn't it? But this 1260 years... This is dealing with the power of the holy people being scattered, isn't it? And what time prophecy is identifying the scattering of the holy people? It's the 2520, okay? So this is speaking about the, the last half of this 2520 that comes to an end in 1798. This times, times, and a dividing of time. 1260 years. But notice th that this is expressed with the words times, times, and a half. Now if you go to your next page, I want to perhaps show you something. From Leviticus 26, we've already identified in the last presentation the 2520. Okay. And in Daniel 8.14, we have the 2300-year prophecy. Now, the 2300-year prophecy ends when? I've only illustrated this once before, so perhaps I should have started a little bit different. But, but what I want you to see here is this 2520 that ends in 1798, based on Daniel 12, verse 7, right? It says times, times and a half. It's 1260 years, but we know it's dealing with the prophecy of the scattering of the holy people. So it's dealing with this time prophecy, the 2520, that begins in 723. If you follow me, say, say amen. But uh, this time prophecy, the 2520, it's directly connected with the other 2520, right? Why is it connected? It's the same prophecy. It's, it's connected by context or logic. It's the punishment for breaking the covenant. So there's a connection there, right? Right? They're, they have to be tied together. Um, so this 2520, I'm going to go like that. It ends in 1844. Right? So this 2520, what it does is it connects with the 2300. And what I'm trying to show you here, brothers and sisters, is that every one of these time prophecies are connected to each other. All right? If, if Sister White, we've read the quote a couple times here. Daniel 7.13, Daniel 8.14, Malachi 3, and the parable of the ten virgins is the same event. And Malachi 3 is dealing with the messenger of the covenant suddenly coming to his temple. Malachi 3 is not dealing with the investigative judgment. It's dealing with the fact that on October 22nd, 1844, the Lord entered into covenant with modern Israel at the time period that the, the 2,520 time prophecy that was identifying the judgment 
against Israel for breaking the covenant concluded. Malachi 3 is dealing with the covenant. But it ends in 1844 at the same time that the 2300 year prophecy ends. Therefore the 2300 year prophecy is directly connected to the 2520 prophecy that begins in 677 but it's also connected to the 2520 that begins in 723 because they're the same prophecy but the one that starts in 723 it ends in 1798 so it's connected to the 1260 years. Right? And this is important to see. Because in Adventism, you have people that take the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335, and they place them at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion. But prophetically, if you're going to do that, you're going to see in a moment, you have to put all of them at the end of the world, because they're all, you can't, you got to bring them all. You got to do them all. You got to do them all. Okay, so now, um, next quote is from Daniel 12, 11, and 12. It says, and from the time that the daily is removed, and the daily was taken away in 508, okay, there will be 1290 days, and that comes to an end in 1798. So, so this 1290 is connected to 1798, so it's connected to the 1260, and it's connected to the 2520, and therefore it's connected to the 2300. Right? But in 508, you also have a prophecy that begins that is 1335 days long, 1335 years. And it ends in 1843. Right? But it's connected to 508. It starts in 508, right when the 1290 starts. So the 1335 is connected to 508, and the 508 is connected to the 1290, and the 1290 is connected to the 1260, which is connected to the 2520, which is connected to that 2520, which is connected to the 2300-year prophecy. Right? <laughs> okay. Now there's one that's a little bit trickier, but I've prepared the way, if you can remember. We talked about a pioneer understanding last night. And the pioneer understanding that we dealt with, and its correct understanding, is that the first angel of Revelation 14, 6, and 7 arrived in history when? In 1798, when the book of Daniel was unsealed. Do you remember when we dealt with that? That was the arrival of the first angel. Amen, if you understand that. Amen. But, on August 11th, 1840, The mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down out of heaven and the pioneers specifically and correctly identified that this is the same angel as that angel. So August 11th, 1840 is the first angel, but the first angel arrives in 1798. So 1798, it's connected to the 1290, to the 1260, to the 2520, to the 2300. But the 391 year and 15 day time prophecy of Revelation 9.15, it's connected to 1798 because it's the same angel. This is the same angel. This is the work. Of, what do the angels represent? They represent the work that God's people accomplish. This is connected by context. This prophecy, 1840, is connected to 1798 and therefore it's connected to the 1290, the 1335, the 2520, the 2520, and the 2300 year prophecy. Do you see it? Now the thing is, if you're going to take the 1290 and the 1335 and the 1260 and say that they are fulfilled at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion, then you need to show how all of these prophecies are fulfilled at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion. Of course, you're going to be destroying the foundations of Adventism when you do it, but you do not have the prophetic authority I mean, not, not necessarily authority, but it's just not, you do not have the prophetic logic to take a couple of these prophecies out of context and leave the other ones behind and say, only these apply here at the end of the world. That's what the Bible calls a private interpretation, and the Bible says prophecy is of no private interpretation. The foundational truths, the time prophecies, that are represented on the 1843 and the 1850 chart are directly tied to one another. And that's not an accident. It's not an accident. Yes. At 391 years and 15 days. This, this bore, I'm not a good writer anyway, but 
this board is a bit wiggly. So do you, so what I'm saying here, maybe you're not too familiar with the time prophecies on that 1843 and 1850 chart. But the Millerites understood they were all connected and they are all connected. In fact, you'll see, um, uh, we don't have to take time to do this. Well, maybe we, we can do this. In Daniel 12.7, the 1260 years, he's expect, it is expressed by times, times, and half a time. That ties together, on your notes, you'll see it ties together with Daniel 7.25, times, times, and dividing a time. That's tying Daniel 12.7 with Daniel 7.25. And then in, in Revelation 12.14, you have times, times, and a half time. So Revelation 12.14 is tied to Daniel 12.7 and Daniel 7.25. Even the different places in the Bible where these time prophecies are expressed are tied together with, with one another. Because in uh, Revelation 12.14 where it says times, times, and half a time, it's the same passage as Revelation 12.6. Revelation 12.6, Revelation 12.14, it's the same commentary. It's the same story. And in verse 14, it's times, times, and half a time, connecting with the book of Daniel. But in verse 6, it's not times, times, and half a time. It's 1,203 score days. Okay? And you should, ha you should have it on your notes. Revelation 6 and 14. Dan Revelation 12, verses 6 and 14, is telling the story about the woman, the Christian church, fleeing into the wilderness during the dark ages of papal rule. And in that story, the 1260 years is expressed two ways. And in verse 14, when it says times, times, and half a time, it's a purposeful connection to the times, times, and half a time that we find in the book of Daniel. But verse 6 and verse 14, they're connected by the context of the story, but in verse 6, it doesn't say times, times, and half a time. It says... 1,203 squared years, and if you look down, days, if you look down on your notes to Revelation 11, 3, it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,203 score days. Revelation 11, 3 is now connected with Revelation 12, verse 6, which is connected with Revelation 12, verse 14, which is connected with Daniel 7:25 and Daniel 12, 7. Okay, they're, they're connected. But, but verse 3 of Revelation 11, it's connected to verse 2 of Revelation 11, where you're going to see the same 1260-year time period, only it's expressed differently. Verse 2 says 42 months. That Revelation 11, 2 says, but they shall tread, the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months. And that connects with Revelation 13, 5. Because Revelation 13, 5 says, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given him to continue 42 months. The Bible is purposeful to tie every one of these prophecies together. If you're going to move one to the end of the world, you've got to move them all to the end of the world. And when you do that, you're destroying the foundations of Adventism. You're, and even if you weren't destroying the foundations of Adventism, you know what you're doing? You're saying that Ellen White's a false prophet. Because she says we can't do that. But brothers and sisters, it's done all the time in Adventism. So we're, yes. Uh, the question is, is those that mu move those time periods to the future, what do they do with the Dark Ages? What they do with it, we know that th there's going to be a papal persecution at the end of the world, and they're saying that 1260 years is prefiguring the papal persecution at the end of the world. And it is. That's true. But they insist that the papal persecution at the end of the world is going to be 1260 days instead of 1260 years. And... They don't, they don't understand that if you're going to take this 1260 years of papal rule and bring it to the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion, you've got to bring all these other time prophecies to the end of the world. And, and you're required to make sure that the sequence stays the same and that the, the symbolical representation of each of these waymarks parallels the end of the world identically. Can't be, can't be just what you decide off the top of your head that these waymarks at the end of the world represent. They don't do that, by the way. I've never seen any of them try to bring all the prophecies to the end of the world. 
It's the 1290, the 1260, the 1335, and sometimes the 2300 year prophecy. 508 is when the pagan resistance to the rise of the papacy was removed at the Battle of the Visigoths. Now, I don't, I wouldn't think that it's it, it's a, it's that important that you uh, that you remember what I just shared with you. What I want you to see here was that the pioneer understanding of all these time prophecies was that they were all connected and whether you can repeat this when you get home tonight or not is not that important to me but you saw that it, they are connected. So all I'm trying to do is, is help you to see that yeah they are connected and if you move them you're going to be moving the pioneer understanding of the sister back there. What's your name sister? Leilani. Leilani. Ask a question. <clears throat> About 508. I'm going to show you a study here real quickly that will defend, defend the pioneer position of the daily because the pioneers believed that the daily represented paganism and they believed that in the year 508 based upon Dan Daniel 12 verses 11 and 12 and, and the rest of prophecy that in the year 508 508 that the resistance that was given against the papacy by paganism was taken out of the way okay in 538 the papacy rose to power okay so very quickly I want to show you the pattern of Christ because the pioneers didn't teach this they didn't recognize this all right there's a pattern of Christ I don't have my notes with me we'll just do this off the top of the head uh, off the top of our head and it's very verifiable Jesus was born and how old was he when he was baptized he was 30 years old this is the 30 year period all right when he was 30 years old, he was empowered. He received power to give his testimony. And how long did Jesus give his testimony for? Three and a half years. At the end of the three and a half years, what happened? And what, one of the things that Christ was doing in this history is he was set aside, setting aside the old dispensation, the old testament, the, the old covenant in order to bring in the new. He was setting aside the earthly sanctuary to bring in the heavenly sanctuary. You understand that? That in this history of Christ there was a change in dispensations. Okay? Now in this history down here, this is the history of Antichrist. And the Antichrist, he's governed by Christ. Because just as in the history of Christ, in here we have a change of dispensations. If you accept the pioneer understanding that in 508, paganism was being set aside. And what was paganism a counterfeit of? The earthly sanctuaries, the worship of the Hebrews. The pagan temples were many times almost identical in their layout. This is the, paganism is the counterfeit for the first dispensation of the earthly sanctuary. And in the history of the papacy, paganism, that dispensation is being set aside. And in the time period when that dispensation has been set, being set aside, paganism's resistance was, moved in, was removed in 508. And 30 years later, the papacy was empowered. And it gave its testimony for how long? <laughs> three and a half years. Prophetic years. And at the end of those three and a half years, what happened? It received its deadly wound. Right? Now, after Christ was crucified, he was resurrected. That's resurrected. R-E-S right 
And then shortly thereafter, he ascended. That's ascended. Correct? You following me? Even though you may not know why I'm saying this. And then, he, there's an illustration of the end of the world in AD 70. Does Sister White not say the destruction of Jerusalem in, in AD 70 is an illustration of the end of the world? Yes, she does. So the, in 87, you have an illustration of the end of the world. And then, Sister White says, this is the unfortunate quote, sometimes isn't understood, it's not a familiar one, but it's there. Sister White says, when Christ, Christ came to earth a second time, she says that. She says he, he came to earth his first time as a babe in Bethlehem, but he came a second time at the Isle of Patmos, with John. She, she calls it a second coming. The coming of Christ to Patmos to give John the revelation, Sister White cl- plainly says, is a type of the second coming of Christ. So let me show you something. Go to Revelation 11. This is the pattern of Christ. On the testimony of two, a thing is established. And Revelation 11, among other things, is about the Word of God, about the Old and the New Testament. Is Jesus the Word of God? So so the word of God in Revelation 11 is going to be also governed by the pattern of Christ. Notice verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. What are the two witnesses here? All the New Testament, this is the word of God. Was Jesus the word of God? Okay, I will give power unto my two witnesses. So they're empowered. Right here where Christ is empowered. And... And they shall prophesy how long? Three and a half years. Three and a half prophetic years, right? The Old and New Testament, they're going to give their testimony for three and a half years in Revelation 11 because they're following the pattern of Christ. A thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. What, What should happen next according to this pattern? They should die next after the three and a half years, right? Let's read on. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, right here, Christ finished his testimony at the cross. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them. And what? Kill them. Right there. Right on time. Same pattern. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city which is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Right where he was crucified. They're crucified. (laughs) And they uh, of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three and a half days, notice what happens. The spirit of life from God entered into them and they what? They were resurrected. They stood on their feet. You see it? You see this pattern? Same as Christ. They stood on their feet and feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended. Didn't Christ ascend next? So did they. It's the identical pattern. And their enemies beheld them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake. You know what that great earthquake was? Tenth part of the city fell. The city is a kingdom and the kingdom was pagan Rome that disintegrated into ten parts and the kingdom, the tenth part of the kingdom that fell here is the French Revolution. This great earthquake is, is the French Revolution. And what Sister White say about the French Revolution? It's an illustration of the end of the world just like the destruction of Jerusalem is. Hmm. It's an identical pattern. So, when you come down to the pattern of the Antichrist, you've got the testimony of two. Christ is setting aside the old dispensation to usher in the new. And Antichrist, is Satan, is setting aside the satanic dispensation of paganism to bring in the satanic dispensation of papalism. And just like Christ, paganism is removed in 508, just like the pioneer said, and 30 years later, the papacy is placed upon the throne of the earth and it's given power to do, give its testimony for three and a half prophetic years. And at the end of those three and a half prophetic years, it receives a deadly wound. But Bible prophecy says that the papacy is going to be resurrected. That's happening right now. 
And then the Bible says that it's going to ascend to the throne of the earth. And then the seven last plagues will come, paralleling the destruction of Jerusalem and the French Revolution. And then the second coming of Christ takes place. So what I'm saying is, is there are arguments to uphold the Millerite position of the daily without going into the Hebrew of the daily that they did not recognize that are absolutely airtight in God's word, even if we don't teach it correctly any longer. The foundations are rock solid. They're rock solid. But we'll try to get through the rest of the notes. That's because the sister asked that question, and I like that presentation. There's other illustrations of this pattern in the Word of God. Do you know that the 144,000 are going to perfectly reflect the character of Christ? And you can show that Adventism is governed by this pattern because it's, it's raised up to perfectly reflect the character of Christ, so it's governed by the pattern of Christ. All right? Yes. <laughs> After the death... He's resurrected, just like the Old and New Testament were in the French Revolution, just like what's going on in the papacies right now. Then he ascended to heaven. Christ did. And so did the two witnesses in the French Revolution. They came, were called to come up hither. And the Bible prophecy says that the papacy, after it's resurrected, is going to ascend to the throne of the earth when the ten kings of Revelation 17, 17 agree to give them their kingdom. Then probation closes. The seven last plagues, that's illustrated by the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and it's also illustrated by the French Revolution, right on time. And this is the seven last plagues. Then when Christ came to Patmos, that was the second coming, and I didn't read it, but in Revelation 11, after the earthquake, you have the second woe is ended, behold, the third woe cometh quickly, and the third woe represents the cataclysmic events that lead to the second coming of Christ. And at the end of the papal history, Christ comes a second time. Oh, explain yourself. It also connects the beast to the dragon. I'm certain of that, but I don't know exactly what you mean. Right. Right. Yep. Okay. By the way, there is more to this. There's more to this. Okay, this is a quick overview. There's three, there's three dispensations. There's the dispensation of the Father, the dispensation of the Son when he walked upon earth, and Sister White, she says this, we are now in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the counterfeit for the dispensation of the Father was paganism. The counterfeit for the dispensation of the Son is the Antichrist, papalism. And the counterfeit for the dispensation of the Holy Spirit is the false prophet, the work that the false prophet does at the end of the world. Okay. Old Testament, Old Testament history it comes to an end. All, 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 the, all the temptations and, and attacks that were carried out against ancient Israel in the Old Testament, they were coming from paganism. Yeah, um, prophetic lines of truth are somewhat like parables. You, you, can, you use them for what they teach you. But they're not going to address every issue. They're just, they, I'm, that is, it isn't, what I'm saying is not a denial of what I think you are saying. It's, it's perhaps. Uh, well, no, 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 that's how we understand it. She just said that from 508 to 538, there's three horns that were removed. But that's not correct. Okay. The, the three horns begin getting removed well before 508. The third one is removed in 538. What happened in 508 is that the, the last bastion of paganism that was, was trying to prevent the papacy from rising to the earth, to the throne of the earth, was the Visigoths, and the French went in and broke their resistance in 508. It wasn't so much as uh, about removing the horns. The taking away of the daily is more about removing the resistance to the rise of the papacy. The three horns is a different, a different line of truth. So to page nine. Or, uh, on page eight, we've, the last quote was Isaiah 58, 12. That we're, there's going to be a work to restore the past to dwell in. We're saying that the past to dwell in are the foundational truths of Adventism. They're the old past. We're also saying that 
the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000. And there was a work of restoration that was accomplished by the Millerites. The old past they were returning to is the, the conclusion of the Protestant Reformation. The Millerites were restoring the foundations of the law of God and the Sabbath and the sanctuary. They were doing that work. But we, we do a parallel work at the end of the world. But we already know about the Sabbath and the law of God and the sanctuary. The work of restoration that's carried on by the 144,000 at the end is re the restoration of the foundational truths of Adventism. And that parallels the work that was accomplished by the Millerites. The Millerites were the climax of the Protestant Reformation, right? That's what it was. Um, so we've read this quote earlier on, on page 9. From early writings, page 258, Sister White says she saw a company who stood well guarded and firm, giving no countenance to those who would unsettle the faith of the body. And she goes on to describe the established faith of the body as the platform and foundation of Adventism. And then she's seen people getting off the platform and examining it and saying it could be made better. And this is the same story that you find in the Bible. The foundations are going to come under attack. And in the next quote, Sister White takes Jeremiah 6.16 in the first paragraph. She's, she concludes with, with quoting Jeremiah 6.16. I'll start in the last couple paragraphs of the first, last couple sentences in the first paragraph. She says, They make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin and rob the people of God of their past experiencing, experience, giving them instead of false science. Thus saith the Lord, standing in the ways and seeing, ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith, the foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Upon these foundations we've been building for more than 50 years. All right? And men may suppose that they found a new way, that they can lay a stronger foundation than that which has been laid, but this is great deception. Other foundation can no man lay than is laid. In the past, many have undertaken to build a new faith and establish new principles. But how long did their building stand? It soon fell, for it was not founded upon the rock. She's quoting from 1 Corinthians 3.11 there, and she says, For other foundation can no man lay than, th than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. She's saying the foundation is Jesus Christ. And then the next quote she says, Review in Herald, April 14, 1903, The warning has come. Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith on which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. That's the foundation of the faith. But no other foundation can man lay than Jesus Christ. Know what she said. Notice what she says. I was in the message, and ever since I've been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed. As day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer, seeking for light. Do you think that I could give up the light that God has given to me? It is to be as the rock of ages. So both Paul and Sister White identify the foundation as Jesus Christ, and the foundation that we have to return to are the truths of 1842, 1843, and 1844 that are represented on the 1843 and the 1850 Pioneer chart. And, it, and it, this, is, this, this describes a real dilemma with this message. With this message, for <laughs> ever since we preached this message, and others are preaching, I, I'm not just me, but every, you preach this message, and what you're going to get, you're going to always have a percentage of your audience that when they walk out, they're going to say, Oh, they know a lot about prophecy, but they never say a word about Jesus Christ. They know a lot about prophecy, but they know nothing about the love of God. But, but Sister White is here saying that the foundation are the messages that we received in 1842, 1843, and 1844, and the only way, the only, the, the only sound way to identify what the messages of 1842 and 1843 and 1844 are is to point to the 1843 and the 1850 pioneer chart. The historical evidence is, is that's what she's speaking about, yet she's the one that says the truths on those charts are the rock of ages. How can that be? That's just a bunch of numbers and time prophecies, is it not? You see, it depends on what you're hearing when you hear these things. Inspiration is clear. She, Sister White has a quote where she says, It was the voice of Christ that spoke from, through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam until the closing scenes of time. The prophetic word is the voice of Christ. The fact that I don't understand that the prophetic word is the voice of Christ is not an argument against the voice of Christ. It's just demonstrating that I don't quite understand what his voice is at this point in time.
Okay, somehow, some way, brothers and sisters, those truths that are represented on those two charts, they're the foundation and platform and Adventism and the pillars when you include the 1850. And they are Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. Because there's no other foundation that can be laid. Now if this is true, and it is, what does it mean that at the end of the world, God's people are attacking these truths? <laughs> On the bottom of page 9 it says, from Matthew 21, 42 to 44, Jesus said unto them, Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. That is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. When they were building the temple, there was a stone that was rejected. The cornerstone. Where do you put the cornerstone? Are there any, are there any bricklayers in here? Oh, part of my family was bricklayers. My uncle and my cousins were bricklayers, and my dad and myself were plasters, and it's the same trade. It's masons, you know, but but we're different. But I've worked around bricklayers. What's the cornerstone? It's the first stone you put in, in the foundation, because that's, that's where you strike your lines from. You put that cornerstone in, and you strike that way, you strike that way, you strike your level. The cornerstone, the cornerstone is the foundation of the foundation. And in the history of the Jews, they had a problem with the foundation. <laughs> in the ancient Israel illustrates modern Israel, does it not? Okay, this, this story of the attack on the foundations, this theme runs throughout the entire Bible. The stone that was rejected is the foundation stone. It's the cornerstone. And the, the foundation stone becomes the capstone. But, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But, whom, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, that is the conclusion, those verses, of the parable of the vineyard. Christ has just given the parable of the vineyard, then he talks about what we just read, the cornerstone, the foundational stone. And in Isaiah 5-7, it tells us what the vineyard is. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And who's Israel at the end of the world? Seventh-day Adventist church. We have the same test over the foundation stone. So you have a quote under, the, under there from Selected Messages, Volume 1, if you're not fam familiar with it. This, this principle, she says, We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not half understand it. We do not half take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a foe we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me once again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God and their experience before the second coming of Christ. We're repeating the history of ancient Israel and inspiration says that over and over again. And in Matthew, after he finishes the parable of the vineyard, he says, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. There's something marvelous about this truth. And that's drawn from Psalm 118, 22 and 23. You can see that under marvelous in, in our eyes. But notice underneath that from Zechariah, chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. Now, is this, is this a testimony about laying the foundation? Okay. All the prophets agree with one another. God isn't the author of confusion, so this is another line of truth on the foundation. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Who's Zerubbabel in this story? He's the, he's the governor of... Israel during the work of rebuilding the temple. But he's going to lay the foundation of the temple, but he's also going to put the capstone on the temple, and he did that. Sister White says he did both. He put the foundation stone down, and he put the capstone on. So in that sense, he's, he's representing Jesus. But when I ask who he is, what's his name mean? Notice what his name means. Z Zerub, from Zerubbabel, means descended of. And Babel means Babylon. 
Zerubbabel means offspring of Babylon. It means come out of Babylon. You see, brothers and sisters, the foundations of Adventism were laid during the second angel's message in that history. And the second angel's message is come out of Babylon or Zerubbabel. And that's the foundations of Adventism. But the fourth angel's message is come out of Babylon. The capstone is Zerubbabel. Okay, so Zerubbabel in this history, he represents Christ, but he represents the foundation and the conclusion of Adventism. The foundation in the Millerite history, the conclusion in the 144,000, because both those histories, and brothers and sisters, this is a strong, easy truth to, to demonstrate. The Millerite history and the history of the 144,000 is built upon the message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The second angel's message and the fourth angel's message are the same. And Sister White said, compares the two times that Christ cleansed the temple with the second and the fourth angel's message. So you're seeing types over and over again in the scriptures that are emphasizing the beginning and ending of Adventism with the expression Babylon has fallen, come out of her, Zerubbabel, and this is one of them. So in Haggai, Chapter 2, so we can understand who Zerubbabel is. It says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow their chariots. And those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every eye of the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and I will make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. And what's a signet? It's a seal. There was a sealing that took place in the Millerite history. In the midnight cry in the summer of 1844, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the Millerites and they were sealed. If you don't think they were, just read Great Controversy 611. Because Sister White says, the mighty angel that comes down out of Revelation 18, she's speaking about it, that in Great Controversy 611, she says, it'll lighten the whole earth with its glory. And then she immediately says in the next sentence, the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And she talks about that in the next paragraph. She says it will be similar to Pentecost. And in Pentecost, and in the Millerite history, and in the history of the 144,000, the Holy Spirit is poured out, and each of those histories are, are prefiguring the ceiling of the 144,000. Yep. And we're going to have that in... in in the notes in the, within the next couple of presentations. But the point is, is at the beginning of Adventism in the midnight cry, the Holy Spirit was poured out and it was prefiguring the sealing of God's people in the 144,000 when the Holy Spirit is poured out. And both of those histories represent Zerubbabel, the foundation and the capstone of Adventism. Zechariah 8, verses 1 and 9. 1 through 9. We're almost done, on time. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with the staff at his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of, the, of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about when Jerusalem gets rebuilt. It's marvelous. And it was marvelous, the story of the, the cornerstone that the men rejected. The marvelous word is tying together the story of the building of Jerusalem, the laying of the foundations, the, the striking of the lines in prophecy, the, the measuring of the city. It's talking about when Jerusalem is built, when God chooses Jerusalem one more time. Say it the Lord of hosts, thus say it the Lord of hosts. Yes, that's, yes, but, but let's not go there, I, take, we have to take questions afterwards, 
I think, thus saith the host, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let, let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days the, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. The story in the Bible of the choosing of Jerusalem, of the building of the temple, is the story of the, the laying of the foundation of Adventism because the prophets are talking about the end of the world. The foundation of Adventism was the Millerite history. It's also the story about the 144,000, the capstone on the temple, the Millerite history. All these stories about building Jerusalem are about Adventism. And that's why in, in Revelation 11, Right after John is told that he'll have to prophesy again at the end of chapter 10, in verses 1 and 2 it says this, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Immediately after October 22, 1844, John, representing the Millerites, was told to measure the temple of God. Why? What's that represent? Pardon me? They had to learn the sanctuary, right? Oct up, up, up until October 22nd, 1844, they, they thought the sanctuary was the earth. But in verse 10 of Revelation 10, the books become bitter in their stomach. That's October 22nd, 1844. So in verse 1 of Revelation 11, they got to measure the temple of God. Is that not right? Okay, now here's something I want you to see if you're not familiar with this. When a prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world. Both the Millerites and 144,000. When the prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world. And God's people at the end of the world are the foundation and the capstone. They're the second angel's message or the fourth angel's message. They're the Millerites of the 144,000. I, I can show this to you. Look at Revelation 10. We're almost done. This is easy to see, generally. Revelation 10, verse 8 through 10. Everyone there? This is an easy one because we're all familiar with this if we've been Adventists very long. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. In verse 1, a mighty angel come down out of heaven and the, had a little book open in his hand. And Sister White says that little book was the book of Daniel. Okay, so that's the context of chapter 10. And John is to go, told to go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Right? And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Now, we understand... That that's the Millerite experience from 1840 to 1844. Because the year-day principle of Bible prophecy was confirmed before the world on August 11th, 1840, and the book of Daniel became very sweet for the Millerites. They took the book, they ate it, it was sweet, right? But on 1844, that whole message became bitter in their stomach, correct? So verses 8 through 10, it's representing the Millerites, correct? Nope. Ah, it is, but only in a secondary sense. Look at verse 9. The Bible, the Bible doesn't make any mistakes. What's verse 9 say? say? It says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. Now notice what the angel says to John. Before he eats the little book, and before it becomes sweet in his mouth, and before it becomes bitter in his stomach, what does the angel tell him in verse 9? Take it and eat it, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Sister White is clear. Adventist historians are clear that the Millerites didn't know the experience they were going to have until after. This is, this is identifying a people that know before they have the experience what the experience is going to be. This is the 144,000. The 144,000 are required to understand the Millerite history, are they not? Sister White says, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget the Lord's leading and teaching in our past history and experience. See, 
when a prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he represents God's people at the end of the world. And here he's representing not only the Millerites, but the 144,000. So, in verse 1 of Revelation 11, when John is told to measure the temple for the Millerites, we've already answered that. They had to come to understand what the temple was, did they not? Because they thought the sanctuary was the earth, and now they have to understand that the sanctuary is the heavenly sanctuary. Right? But when a prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he's representing God's people at the end of the world, and it's the Millerites and 144,000. Hmm. So how is it that God's people at the end of the world have to measure the temple? They have to understand that the foundation of the temple was laid from 1798 to 1844. That's when the temple was erected for Adventism. They have to understand the history of 1798 to 1844. They have to understand the reform movement of the Millerites because that reform movement is going to be repeated to the very letter. And any Seventh-day Adventist that doesn't enter into that work will be paralleling the Millerites who decided they weren't going to enter into the work that was given them. see that? We're going to deal a little bit more, Lord willing, before we get out of here with the fact that when a prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he illustrates God's people at the end of the world. Uh, some of you look, uh, look just a little bit blank. Let me show you one more real quick so you, you'll see that this is sound upon the testimony of two or three things established. Turn to Zechariah chapter 4. This is very easy to see. Zechariah chapter 4, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, but when a prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world. And in verse 1, it says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of the sleep. Why do we have to know that Zechariah was asleep? I don't know, but it's, that's what we're told. And he gets woke up. Verse 2, And he said unto me, What seest thou? Now here's what Zechariah sees. Now remember, Zechariah is a prophet that's alive and serving as a prophet in the time period when they're rebuilding the temple. So Zechariah, as a prophet, he's going to know what the temple furnishing is, isn't he? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon it, the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. What's the seven-branch candlestick? It's the candlestick in the holy place, isn't it? Everyone knows that. And Zechariah is a prophet. He knows that, right? Notice verse 3. And two olive trees by it, one up on the right side of the bowl, and the other on the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel and talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Zechariah doesn't know what it is. He's a, he's a prophet that's living when they're rebuilding the temple and he doesn't know what the seven branch candlestick is. And it's not just, it's not a minor thought here. Notice the next verse. What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what thou these be? The angel's emphasizing the fact that Zechariah doesn't know what this is. So who is Zechariah? Zechariah is the Millerites that are awakened at the midnight cry in the summer of 1844 only to realize they don't know what the sanctuary is. Okay? But he's also illustrating God's people at the end of the world. They get woke up in the midnight cry and they don't realize what the candlestick represents at the end of the world. And we'll take that up in, an, in one of our following presentations. Shall we have a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we ask that you would awaken us through the outpouring of your spirit and give us the wisdom and discernment to see what we each need to do in our lives through the power of your spirit to become a perfect reflection of your character that we might be among those that participate in this final warning message that's about to go to planet earth with power. We've been Laodiceans, we've been asleep. We want to be awakened and bring our lives into agreement with these things. And we give you permission to do what it takes in each of our lives to make this a reality. We know that we have friends and family that are not preparing, that aren't walking the right direction. We ask that you would do what it takes to awaken them to these things as well. 
And as we part this evening, we ask that you would want to give us, give us traveling mercies and give us a, a good night's sleep that we can be refreshed tomorrow. And we thank you for the time we've spent here so far this week. Help us to bring everything in order that we need to tomorrow that we can um, bring these messages to a conclusion in a, a way that would glorify you upon the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>